And with that beautiful musical introduction, I see it is six o'clock. So um, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming and welcome Adam Miller. Very excited and honored that he's joining us tonight to share folk songs of World War I. So with that, I'll turn it over to Adam. Thanks everybody. Oh, Anne, thank you so much. Well, hello, friends. My name is Adam Miller, and I want to talk to you about the First World War. In the beginning, it was France and England's war against Germany. America didn't enter for three more years. So for those three years, it was sort of their war, and people watched across the ocean and didn't think that America was going to participate. But then in April of 1917, President Woodrow Wilson sent American troops to aid France and England in their war against Germany, in the war that they called the war to end all wars, the war that we call the First World War. The Broadway composer George M. Cohan was sitting at his breakfast table when he read the news that American troops were being sent to France in April of 1917, and he turned to his wife and he said, don't expect this war to deliver any good music. And two weeks later, he wrote this song, and it was a big hit in 1917 by George M. Cohan. <laughs> Johnny, get your gun, get your gun, get your gun. Take it on the run, on the run, on the run. Hear them calling you and me, every son of liberty. Hurry right away, no delay, go today. Make your daddy glad to have had such a lad. Tell your sweetheart not to pine to be clear out her boys in line. Over there, over there, send the word, send the word over there. That the Yanks are coming, the Yanks are coming, the drums rum tumming everywhere. So prepare, say a prayer, send the word, send the word over there. We'll be over, we're coming over, and we won't come back till it's over, over there. Johnny, get your gun, get your gun, get your gun. Johnny, show the hun, you're a son of a gun. Hoist that flag and let her fly. Yankee doodle, do or die. Pack your little kit, show your grit, do your bit. Yankees to the ranks, from the towns and the tanks. Make your mother proud of you and the old red, white, and blue. Over there, over there, send the word, send the word over there. That the Yanks are coming, the Yanks are coming, the drums rum tumming everywhere. So prepare, say a prayer, send the word, send the word over there. We'll be over, we're coming over, and we won't come back till it's over over there. This program of folk songs of the First World War is presented by the E.D. Locke Public Library in McFarland, Wisconsin. So Over There was a big hit, a top 10 song in 1917, and a year later in 1918, this next song was a big hit. This was written by a Canadian-born vaudevillian by the name of Jeff O'Hara. 
This song was billed 103 years ago as a sensational, stammering song success sung by soldiers and sailors. It made fun of someone with a stutter, something that popular music wouldn't do today, but 103 years ago, it was a great big hit, and the song went like this. Sing along if you remember this chorus. Katie was a... Excuse me. Jimmy was a soldier brave and bold. Katie was a maid with hair of gold. Like an act of fate, she was standing at the gate, watching all the boys on dress parade. Kate smiled with a twinkle in her eye. Jim said, Mama, ma meet you by and by. That same night at eight, Jim was standing at the gate. Stuttering this song to k k kate A k k k katie beautiful Katie, you're the only g g g girl that I adore. When the m m m moon shines over the cow shed, I'll be waiting at the k k k kitchen door. K k k katie beautiful Katie. You're the only g g g girl that I adore. When the m m m moon shines over the cow shed, I'll be waiting at the k k k kitchen door. No one ever looked so nice and neat. No one could be just as cute and sweet. That's what Jimmy thought when the wedding ring he bought. Now he's off in France, the foe to meet. Jimmy. Thought he'd like to take a chance, see if he could make the Kaiser dance, stepping to a tune all about the silvery moon. This is what they hear in far off France. K -k -k Katie, beautiful Katie, you're the only g -g -g girl that I adore. When the m m m moon shines over the cow shed, I'll be waiting at the k, -k, -k kitchen door. k, -k, -k Katie, beautiful Katie, you're the only g -g -g girl that I adore. When the m m m moon shines over the cow shed, I'll be waiting at the k, -k, -k kitchen door. Professor Charles Seeger was an ethnomusicologist. That means that he studied the music of non-Western cultures, and he's most famous for being the father of Pete and Peggy and Mike Seeger, all renowned folk singers in their time. Charlie Seeger was born in 1886. His little brother, Alan, who was two years younger, joined the French Foreign Legion in 1914 when England and France declared war on Germany. Alan Seeger was killed by a sniper's bullet on Tuesday, July 4th of 1916, fighting in Europe. There's a stand of protected old growth at Rothrock State Forest in western Pennsylvania. It's called the Alan Seeger Nature Area. Alan Seeger wrote this poem in 1915. I learned it back in the fifth grade. It's called I have a rendezvous with death. I have a rendezvous with death at some disputed barricade when spring comes round with rustling shade and apple blossoms fill the air. I have a rendezvous with death when spring brings back blue days and fair. It may be he shall take my hand and lead me into his dark land and close my eyes and quench my breath. It may be I shall pass him still. I have a rendezvous with death on some scarred slope of battered hill when spring comes round again this year and the first meadow flowers appear. God knows twere better to be deep, pillowed in silk and scented down, where love throbs out in blissful sleep and pulse night to pulse and breath to breathe where hushed awakenings are dear. But I've a rendezvous with death at midnight in some flaming town when spring trips north again this year. And I, to my pledge word, am true. I shall not miss that rendezvous.
70 million people participated in the First World War. Between 1914 and 1918, there were so many war widows, so many women lost fiancés and lovers and husbands. During the Second World War, two decades later, many of these First World War widows attended the local country dances. These country dances kept alive the memory of their partners who died back in the First World War. In some villages, so many men were lost. Dances traditionally danced by men were now danced by women to preserve the tradition and to keep them from disappearing. 60 years ago, Austin John Marshall wrote this poem and set it to the traditional tune, The False Bride, which is also called I Once Loved a Lass. It discusses Whitsuntide, which is a holiday that begins on the seventh Sunday after Easter. This is called Dancing at Whitsun. <laughs> It's fifty long spring times since she was a bride, but still you may see her at each Whitsuntide in a dress of white linen with ribbons of green, as green as her memories of loving. Feet that were nimble, tread carefully now, as gentle a measure as age will allow. Through groves of white blossoms by fields of young corn, where once she was pledged to her true love. Down from the green farmlands and from their loved ones marched husbands and brothers and fathers and sons. They have gone where the forests of oak trees before have gone to be wasted in battle. fields they stand empty, the hedges grow free, no young man to tend them, or pastures go see. There's a fine roll of honor where the maypole once stood, and the ladies go dancing at Whitson. There's a straight row of houses, and these latter days, all covering the downs where the sheep used to graze. There's a wreath of red poppies, a gift from the queen, but the ladies remember it's Whitson, and the ladies go dancing at Whitson. The poet Sarah Teasdale was in her 30s in 1917 when the United States entered the war to end all wars, what we call the First World War. Sarah Teasdale wrote this poem in 1917 and it is called Wartime. There will come soft rains and the smell of ground and swallows circling with their shimmering sound. Frogs will sing in the pools at night, and wild plum trees in tremulous white. Robins will wear their feathery fire, whispering their whims on a low fence wire. And not one will know of the war. Not one will care at last when it is done. Not one would mind neither earth nor tree if mankind perished utterly. And Spring herself, when she awoke at dawn, would scarcely know that we were gone. 
There are two kinds of American popular songs written during the First World War. The first group of songs are the ones that were written before April of 1917, when it was their war, not our war. And we talked about things like keeping the home fires burning and pacifism and all of those things. But once it became our war, once America entered the war, nobody wrote any songs like that anymore. And they were all about going over there and killing the Hun and winning the victory and being the laddies who fought and won. So this is a song that comes from that first period of songs that were written before it was America's war back in the days in 1915 when it was their war across the Atlantic. This song was written in 1915 by the Canadian songwriter, the lyricist Alfred Bryan, who's best remembered today for writing the lyrics to the song Come Josephine in My Flying Machine. The music is written by Al Pian Tadasi. In 1915, they published this, and it sold 700,000 copies of sheet music, an awful lot of sheet music to sell, prior to April 17, 1917, when America entered the war. Uh, a singer by the name of Morton Harvey recorded this song on a 78 RPM record back in 1915, and Morton Harvey's career became a casualty of the First World War because in April of 1917, when America entered the war, Nobody would buy his records anymore, and he was never hired to make another recording. But you can go on YouTube and listen to his record of I Didn't Raise My Boy to Be a Soldier, written 106 years ago and still one of the greatest American anti-war songs of all time. Ten million soldiers to the war have gone who may never return again. Ten million mothers' hearts but break for the ones who died in vain. Head bound down in sorrow in her lonely years, I heard a mother murmur through her tears. I didn't raise my boy to be a soldier. I brought him up to be my pride and joy. Who dares to place a musket on his shoulder to shoot some other mother's darling boy? Glad nations arbitrate their future troubles. It's time to lay the sword and gun away. There'd be no war today if mothers all would say, I didn't raise my boy to be a soldier. What victory can cheer a mother's heart? When she looks at her blighted home, what victory can bring her back what she dares to call her own? Let each mother answer in the years to be, remember that my boy belongs to me. I didn't raise my boy to be a soldier. I brought him up to be my pride and joy. Who dares to place a musket on his shoulder to shoot some other mother's darling boy? Let nations arbitrate their future troubles. It's time to lay the sword and gun away. There'd be no war today if mothers all would say, I didn't raise my boy to be a soldier. Well, by 1918, Five million soldiers had been fed into what they called the sausage factory, which is to say that they were killed in battle. And so in 1918, in the trenches in France, they were singing, I didn't raise my boy to be a sausage. And speaking of the trenches, an American major noted in a 1918 sanitation report on the planned eradication of rats from the trenches in an effort to prevent disease. He wrote, certain unexpected problems involved in the rat. 
The rat serves only one useful function. They consume corpses on no man's land, a job which the rat alone is willing to undertake. And for this reason, it has been found desirable to control rather than to eliminate the rat. No man's land refers to that area between the two earthen dugouts. You see, this was trench warfare 105 years ago in the First World War. The French army would dig a trench in the mud over here, and 700 feet away, the Germans would dig a trench in the mud over here. A trench deep enough that you could duck and avoid gunfire from the other side, but shallow enough that you could pop your gun over the top and get a few shots off at the enemy before they shot at you. No man's land refers to that area in between the two trenches where no man could survive. They'd put up a few barbed wire fences between the trenches, and I don't mean just a few. I mean, when the American army got to France in 1917, they put up seven million miles of barbed wire fences. And you may be familiar with the expression three on a match. This comes out of the First World War where the English soldier would take his box of stick matches and strike the first match and light his cigarette, and then reach over and light his buddy's cigarette. And when he moved the match over to the third fella's cigarette, by then the German sniper had been following the lit flame of the match. And by the time it got to the third soldier, that soldier was shot dead. Most people don't remember the story that it came from, but we still have that expression about three on a match. So here's a song about no man's land. This song has been sung in all of the wars in the last hundred years. My understanding is it comes out of the First World War, but it might even be older than that. It's got an easy chorus that anybody can jump in and sing along on, so feel free to join me on the chorus. It goes like this. Let me get my key. If you're looking for the general, I know where he is. I know where he is. I know where he is. If you're looking for the general, I know where he is. He's pinning another medal on his chest. I saw him. I saw him. Pinning another medal on his chest, I saw him pinning another medal on his chest. And if you're looking for the colonel, I know where he is, I know where he is, I know where he is. If you're looking for the colonel, I know where he is, he's home again on seven days of leave. I saw him, I saw him. Home again on seven days leave. I saw him home again on seven days leave. Now if you're looking for the captain, I know where he is. I know where he is. I know where he is. If you're looking for the captain, I know where he is. He's sleeping with the corporal's wife. I saw him. I saw him sleeping with the corporal's wife. I saw him sleeping with the corporal's wife. And if you're looking for the quartermaster, I know where he is. I know where he is. I know where he is. If you're looking for the quartermaster, I know where he is. He's ripping off the company's stores. I saw him. I saw him ripping off the company's stores. I saw him ripping off the company's stores. Now, if you're looking for the sergeant, I know where he is. I know where he is. I know where he is. If you're looking for the sergeant, I know where he is. He's cowering on the dugout floor. I saw him. I saw him cowering on the dugout floor. I saw him cowering on the dugout floor. Now, if you're looking for your husband, I know where he is. I know where he is. I know where he is. If you're looking for your husband, I know where he is. He's hanging on the old barbed wire. I saw him. I saw him. Hanging on the old barbed wire, I saw him hanging on the old barbed wire. The poet Robert W. Service is best remembered for having written The Cremation of Sam McGee, a poem that many of us learned and recited in grade school. Robert W. Service was already 41 years old in 1914 when England declared war on Germany and the First World War began. He tried to enlist, but he was turned down because he was too old. 
Um, he joined the Ambulance Corps for the American Red Cross, and he drove an ambulance in Europe during the First World War. His brother Alan also joined the service to fight on France's behalf and was killed in France in 1916. Robert W. Service wrote this poem and published in a book called Ballads of a Bohemian, published in 1921. Atheists and believers all can agree that thou shalt not kill. But it becomes a little more complicated when you enter the service and you go from thou shalt not kill to thou shalt kill. And then when the war is over, you come home and it's thou shalt not kill again. This is Robert W. Service's poem published in 1921 called, Was It You? Hello, young Jones, with your tie so gay and your pen behind your ear. Will you mark my check in the usual way, for I'm overdrawn, I fear. Then you look at me in a manner bland, and you turn your ledger leaves, and you hand it back with a soft white hand and the air of a man who grieves. Was it you, young Jones? Was it you I saw? And I think I see you yet, with a live bomb gripped in your grimy paw, and your face to the parapet, with your lips a snarl, and your eyes gone mad, with a fury that filled you through. And I look at you now, and I think, my lad, was it you, young Jones? Was it you? Hello, young Smith, with your well-fed look and your coat a dapper fit. Will you recommend me a decent book with nothing of war in it? And you smile as you polish a fingernail, and your eyes serenely roam, and you suavely hand me a thrilling tale by a man who stayed at home. Was it you, young smith? Was it you I saw in the battle's storm and stench, with a roar of rage and a wound-red raw leap into a reeking trench, as you stood like a fiend on the firing shell, and you stabbed and you hacked and slew? And I look at you now, and I ask myself, was it you, young smith? Was it you? Hello, old brown, with your ruddy cheek and your tummy's rounded swell, your garden's looking jolly chic and your kitties are awfully well. And you beam at me in your cheery way and you wave your watering can and you mop your brow and you blithely say, what about golf, old man? Was it you, old brown? Was it you I saw like a bulldog stick to your gun, a cursing devil of fang and claw when the rest were on the run, your eyes aflame with the battle hate? Now you sit in the family pew, and I see you rising to pass the plate. Was it you, old Brown? Was it you? Was it me and you? Was it you and me? Is that grammar or is it not? Who groveled in filth and misery, who gloried and groused and fought? Which is the right and which is the wrong? Which is the false and the true? The man of peace or the man of fight? Which is the me and the you? This next song was a great big hit in 1914 in England when England entered the war. And Al Jolson recorded it here in the United States, and he had a great hit record, uh, a live recording with a live audience, a wonderful 78, and I'm sure it's on YouTube. The song was written by Robert Pat Weston, an English songwriter who is best remembered today for writing the song about Anne Boleyn. With her head tucked underneath her arm, she walks the bloody tower. So this is the one he wrote. It was a tongue twister, and it's called... Sister Susie's Sewing Shirts for Soldiers. It was a big hit. Sister Susie's sewing in the kitchen on a singer. There's miles and miles of flannel on the floor and on the stairs. And father says it's rotten, getting mixed up with the cotton and sitting on the needles that she leaves upon the stair. And should you knock at our front door, mother says, come inside. And if you ask where Susie is, she says with loving pride, Sister Susie's sewing shirts for soldiers. 
shoes, such skillet sewing shirts. Our shy young sister Susie sews. Some soldiers send epistles saying they'd sooner sleep on thistles than the softy soft short shirts for soldiers. Sister Susie sews. Oh, Sister Susie sewing shirts for soldiers. Such skillet sewing shirts. Our shy young sister Susie sews. Some soldiers send epistles saying they'd sooner sleep on thistles than the saucy soft short shirts for soldiers sister susie shows oh sister susie sewing shirts for soldiers such skillet sewing shirts our shy young sister susie sews some soldiers send epistles saying they'd sooner sleep on thistles than the saucy soft short shirts for soldiers sister susie sews <laughs> If you know one Australian song, you probably know Waltzing Matilda, written in 1895 by the beloved Aussie poet Banjo Patterson. And like most good folk songs, he recycled a traditional tune, the Craigie Lee March. And uh, this was back in 1895. And uh, I'll play a little bit of it just to refresh your memory if it slipped your mind. It's the tune that goes like this. So the song says, Waltzing Matilda, Waltzing Matilda, who'll come a waltzing Matilda with me? Well, waltzing Matilda is a colloquial Australian expression from a hundred years ago that I understand they still use. It means to go camping. It means to take a tent and a backpack and go sleep out of doors. So when you say, who'll go waltzing Matilda with me? You're asking, who's going to go camping with me? Let's go out camping for the weekend. So um, I'd like to sing you a song about the First World War. Some of the best songs about the First World War were written decades afterwards. This song was written about 50 years ago by a a uh, Scottish man who makes his home in Australia, the singer-songwriter Eric Bogle. He wrote this about the Australian New Zealand Army Corps, the Anzac Troops. Anzac Day is April 25th, and they still have parades for it in New Zealand and Australia. Most people in America don't know about Anzac Day. In 1915, back when it was their war, before America joined, 130,000 so 130, soldiers were killed in Gallipoli, Turkey, in a horrific battle on April 25th of 1915. 8,700 of them were from Australia. So um, Eric Bogle wrote this song about what happened then on Anzac Day in 1915, April 25th, 1915, in Gallipoli, Turkey. And the song is called, And the Band Played Waltzing Matilda. Now when I was a young man, I carried my pack And I lived the free life of the rover From the Murray's Green Basin to the dusty outback I waltzed my Matilda all over Then in 1915, my country said, son it's time to stop rambling, there's work to be done. And they gave me a tin hat, they gave me a gun. And they sent me away to the war. And the band played waltz in Matilda. As the ship pulled away from the quay. And amid all the cheers, Flag a waving in tears, we sailed off for Gallipoli. Well, I remember that terrible day when our blood stained the sand and the water, and how in that hell that they called Suvla Bay, we were butchered like lambs to the slaughter. 
Johnny Turkey was ready. He primed himself well, rained us with bullets and showered us with shells. And in five minutes flat, we were all blown to hell. Nearly blew us back home to Australia. And the band played Waltz and Matilda as we stopped to bury our slain. And we buried ours, and the Turks buried theirs. And then it started all over again. Those that were living just tried to survive. In that mad world of blood, death, and fire. And for ten weary weeks I kept myself alive, while around me the corpses filed higher. Then a big Turkish shell knocked me ass overhead, and when I awoke in my hospital bed and saw what it had done, I wished I was dead. Never knew there were worse things than dying. For the band, for more, I'll go waltz and Matilda. All around the green bush far and near. For to hump tent and pegs, a man needs both legs. No more waltz and Matilda for me. They collected the wounded, the crippled, the maimed. They shipped us back home to Australia. The armless, the legless, the blind, the insane. Those proud wounded heroes of Suva. And when the ship pulled into Circular Quay, I looked at the place where my legs used to be and thank Christ there was no one there waiting for me to grieve and to mourn and to pity and the band played waltz and Matilda as they carried us down the gangway nobody cheered they just stood there and stared and they turned all their faces away. So now every April, I sit on my porch and I watch the parade pass before me. I see my old comrades, how proudly they march, renewing their dreams of past glory. I see the old men all tired, stiff, and sore, the forgotten heroes of a forgotten war. And the young people ask, what are they marching for? And I ask myself the same question. And the band plays Waltz and Matilda, and the old men still answer the call. But year after year, Numbers get fewer, someday no one will march there at all. Waltz and Matilda, Waltz and Matilda, who'll come a Waltz and Matilda with me? And their ghosts may be heard as they march by the Billabong. Come a waltz in Matilda with me. Well, by 1918, the songwriters had pretty well used up all the ideas for making good songs, and they started making some really bad songs. This one was General Pershing's absolute favorite. And it went like this. Oh, we don't want the bacon. No, we don't want the bacon. All we want is a piece of the rind. 
We'll crown Bill the Kaiser with a bottle of Budweiser, and we'll have a marvelous time. Oh, Wilhelm the Gross, we'll say, was is dos, when we cross that Hindenburg line. No, we don't want the bacon, no, we don't want the bacon, all we want is a piece of the Rhine. This next song I recorded on my new album, which is a holiday CD, uh, a Christmas album of holiday songs for the winter holidays. The album's called Make My Present Small, and you can get it from my website, folksinging.org. This is a song that's written by a contemporary singer-songwriter by the name of John McCutcheon. He wrote this song about, oh, I guess probably 45 years ago. Uh, he found the story in a library book, in the public library, a book called The Singing Soldiers by John Jacob Niles, published in 1927. It tells a true story of what happened back when it was their war, Christmas of 1914. And the song is called Christmas in the Trenches, a true story. <laughs> My name is Francis Tolliver, I come from Liverpool. The First World War was waiting for me when I finished school. To Belgium and to Flanders, to Germany to here. I fought for king and country, I love dear. Twas Christmas in the trenches and the frost so bitter hung. The frozen fields of France were cold, no Christmas songs were sung. Our families back in England were toasting us that day, their brave and glorious lads so far away. I was lying with my messmate on the cold and rocky ground when across the lines of battle came a most peculiar sound. Says I, now listen up, me boys, each soldier strained to hear as one lone German voice rang out so clear. He's singing bloody well, you know, my partner said to me. Soon one by one each German voice joined in in harmony. The cannons rested silent and the gas clouds rolled no more as Christmas brought us respite from the war. When his song was finished and a reverend pause was spent, God rest ye merry gentlemen, struck up some boys from Kent. The next they sang is stilly knocked, tis silent night, says I. And in two tongues, one song lit up that sky. There's someone coming toward us, the frontline sentry cried. All eyes were fixed on one lone figure, trudging from their side. His peace flag, like a Christmas star, shone on the plain so bright as he bravely strode unarmed into the night. Soon one by one on either side walked into no man's land with neither gun or bayonet. We met them hand to hand. We shared some secret brandy and we wished each other well. And in a flare-lit soccer game, we gave them hell. We traded chocolates and cigarettes and photographs from home. These sons and fathers far away from families of their own. Young Sanders played his squeeze box and they had a violin. This curious and unlikely band of men. Then daylight stole upon us, and France was France once more. With long goodbyes and sad farewells, we settled back to war. But the question haunted every man who lived that wondrous night. Whose family have I fixed within my sight? Twas Christmas in the trenches, and the frost so bitter hung. The frozen fields of France were warmed as Christmas songs were sung. 
for the walls they built between us to exact the work of war had crumbled and were gone forevermore. My name is Francis Tolliver, in Liverpool I dwell. Each Christmas come since World War I, I've learned my lesson well. That the ones who call the shots won't be among the dead and lame. And on each end of the rifle, we hear the same. Irving Berlin is probably the greatest American composer of the 20th century. He was born in Mogilev, Russia. I'm talking about the man who wrote White Christmas and God Bless America. He came to this country with his rabbi father, an impoverished Jewish family, came through Ellis Island and lived in a cold water walk-up flat in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. He got a job on the Bowery as a singing waiter and became a songwriter. And in 1911, he published a song called Alexander's Ragtime Band that sold a million copies of sheet music in 90 days. This was a pretty exceptional hit piece of music. And then uh, in 1914, when England and France declared their war on Germany, he wrote an anti-war song. Remember, it was their war. You could write anti-war songs. And um, I don't know. I imagine this song was recorded. It certainly sold copies of sheet music. Um, in 1917, when America entered the war, Irving Berlin became very ashamed of this anti-war song and tried to buy up all the copies of sheet music and any 78 RPM recordings that were made of it. I learned this song from the singing of Groucho Marx from the Marx Brothers. He loved to sing this song on the radio. And whenever he did sing it on the radio, once he returned to his dressing room after the show, Irving Berlin would call him on the phone in the dressing room and he would say, Groucho, it's Irving. If you ever feel like singing that song again, call me and I'll pay you a hundred dollars not to. That's how ashamed of the song Irving Berlin was. Written in 1914, the year that Germany and England began their war in the First World War. So I thought you should hear this wonderful anti-war song that Irving Berlin wrote. It's called, Stay Down Here Where You Belong. Down below, down below, sat the devil talking to his son, who wanted to go up above, up above. You say it's too hot for you down here, and so the devil said, listen, lad, listen to your dear old dad. You stay right here where you belong. The folks above you, they don't know right from wrong. To please their kings, they've all gone off to war. But not a one of them knows what they're fighting for. Way up above, they say that I'm a devil and I'm bad. But those kings up there are bigger devils than your dad. They're breaking the hearts of mothers. They're making butchers out of brothers. You'll find more hell up there than there is down here below. 
Irving Berlin, 1914. Three years later, Irving Berlin was drafted into the United States Army as a private, and he was stationed at Camp Upton in Yap Hank, New York, where he composed an all-soldier musical review called Yip Yep, Yap Hank, and he wrote a big patriotic closing number, a great big finale for the show called God Bless America. But he didn't think anybody in 1918 would appreciate such a patriotic flag waving song. After all, they were going over to Germany and trying to kill the hung. So he stuck it in his trunk and it wasn't published for another 20 years till 1938. But in 1918 at Camp Upton in Yapank, New York, he wrote a song about a common experience for soldiers, an experience so common that anyone who's had a job, anyone who's ever been a student knew that feeling. And so that's why 103 years later, people still know the chorus to the song Irving Berlin wrote for Yip Yip Yapank 103 years ago. And please join me on the chorus of this song that survives in the oral tradition by the late great Irving Berlin. I've been a soldier quite a while, and I will now relate. The army life is wonderful, the army food is great. I sleep with 97 others in a wooden hut. I love them all, they all love me, it's very lovely, but Oh, how I hate to get up in the morning. Oh, how I'd love to remain in bed. For the hardest thing of all is to hear the bugler call. You gotta get up, you gotta get up, you gotta get up this morning. One day I'm going to murder the bugler. Someday they're going to find him dead. I'll amputate his reveille and step upon it heavily and spend the rest of my life in bed. A bugler in the army is the luckiest of men. He wakes the boys at five and then goes back to sleep again. He doesn't have to blow again until the afternoon. If everything goes well for me, I'll be a bugler soon. But Oh, how I hate to get up in the morning. Oh, how I'd love to remain in bed. For the hardest thing of all is to hear the bugler call. You gotta get up, you gotta get up, you gotta get up this morning. One day I'm going to murder the bugler. Someday they're going to find him dead. I'll put my uniform away and move to Philadelphia and spend the rest of my life in bed. Irving Berlin. This program of folk songs of the First World War is presented by the E.D. Locke Public Library in McFarland, Wisconsin. Please remember that libraries will get you through times of no money a whole lot better than money is going to get you through times of no libraries. My name is Adam Miller. My website is folksinging.org, F-O-L-K-S-I-N-G-I-N-G dot O-R-G. I encourage you to go to my website and order a real three-dimensional physical CD that can be autographed and wrapped as a gift and passed on to children and grandchildren to enjoy for decades to come. Available from my website, folksinging.org. I'm going to close this program with the most popular song of the entire war and the most popular song of the entire decade. A man named Jack Judge wrote this song singing in the British Music Hall. It was composed in 1912, two years before they even know they were going to have a First World War or a war to end all wars. John McCormick, the great Irish tenor, made a classic and famous recording of this song in 1914. It's the most popular song of World War I and the entire 1910 decade. And uh, as I say, it is a folk song, which means that it exists in the oral tradition, so you, the folks, can join me on the chorus. 
Up to mighty London came an Irishman one day. As the streets are paved with gold, sure everyone was gay. Singing songs of Piccadilly, Strand, and Leicester Square. Till Paddy got excited and he shouted to them there. It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way to go. It's a long way to Tipperary, to the sweetest girl I know. Well, it's goodbye to Piccadilly, and it's farewell, Leicester Square. It's a long, long way to Tipperary, but my heart's right there. Can we sing it together? It's a long way to Tipperary, it's a long way to go. It's a long way to Tipperary, to the sweetest girl I know. Well, it's goodbye to Piccadilly, and it's farewell, Leicester Square. It's a long, long way to Tipperary, but my heart's right there. Paddy wrote the letter to his Irish Molly, oh, saying if you don't receive it, write and let me know. If I make mistakes in spelling, Molly dear, said he, remember it's the pen that's bad, don't lay the blame on me. It's a long way to Tipperary, it's a long way to go. It's a long way to Tipperary, to the sweetest girl I know. Well, it's goodbye to Piccadilly, and it's farewell, Leicester Square. It's a long, long way to Tipperary, but my heart's right there. It's a long, long way to Tipperary, but my heart's right there. Thank you so much. I will make a concerted effort to come and visit you all in McFarland when this little pandemic is all over. Thanks so much for inviting me to your library. Thank you so much, Adam. Good night, everyone. Take care. Thanks for being here. See you next time, friends. <laughs>